morning. I'm Susan Kish. I'll be hosting this session. I'm a member of the program committee. Um, and it's going to talk about novel data collections. Our first paper is being presented by Esther Rolf. She is a PhD candidate in machine learning at UC Berkeley. And we'll talk about ground control to Major Tom, the application of field surveys in remote sensing. Esther. Hi, my name is Esther Rolf, and I'm going to present some work that's in collaboration with the students and professors in the computer science department and the policy lab, the global policy lab at UC Berkeley. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the importance of ground surveying when you're training algorithms that use remote sensing data. Uh, so remote sensing data, and we're specifically going to talk about satellite images, has uh, afforded this wealth of research that before we couldn't get data on. So now we can assess um, climate measures such as snow cover or um, ground water quality. Uh, we can track road cover and we can estimate population density. And this is a new paradigm because we don't have to send people to gather this data. We have satellites orbiting the Earth that are taking these images, and researchers can sit in their lab, download these images, and train a predictor based on them. So what does training this predictor actually look like? Uh, so let's focus on wealth estimation in Cambodia. Uh, you're going to download a bunch of images. You're going to either, if you're lucky, send out people to take surveys and knock on people's houses and say, what was your annual income this year? Um, or an alternative is to use data sets that are, that are already available to you. Um, so from these images and the observation pairs, like household income, you're going to learn a predictor. And this is a function that takes in these images and spits out a predicted household income estimate for houses in that image. So this is great. So we've trained the model. Um, and we want to generalize to new regions where we didn't send people out to survey or we didn't have it available in the sample that we got. So we put in a new image, we feed it into the predictor, and it spits out a predicted value for household income in this new region. Uh, but what we're missing is we don't have a great way to validate this model and this predictor. Uh, so one thing we do know, it's generally very well accepted, that the more training data on the left we can feed this model, the better predictor we'll get. Uh, so we want as many images as possible and as many observations as possible. Uh, but So what does this look like? We can get more images fairly easily. There are companies uh, that devote an insane amount of effort and research into getting these images and making them publicly available to researchers. So we're going to say that the images are not our problem here in scaling up. But what if we want more observations? We're going to send more people on the ground, um, and that's time and that's money. And this is really the bottleneck in learning good predictors here. So my collaborators and I sat down and made a short list of things we would really like to do with remote sensing data. But all of these rely on fundamentally being able to have good ground truth data. And it's exactly this ground truth data that's expensive. And so that's the motivation here. Uh, so our work is focusing on how survey strategies limit predictive performance, specifically in this regime where you're pairing these data sets with remote sensing data. So as a little thought experiment, imagine that you are surveying for wealth in Cambodia and you have limited resources. So these 10 figures on the left represent time, they represent money, they represent physical people, all of these things. Uh, so one way you could implement your survey is to sample uniformly from the space or the population in Cambodia. But think about what this actually means. You're traveling on dirt roads, you're getting a translator who speaks a specific dialect of Khmer, all of this is really expensive, and it, to go to remote regions and villages where you may get like 10 samples for this guy up there. So to leverage your resources effectively, another thing you can do is focus on a few regions of high density and cluster your resources 
and focus on like cities where you can get a lot of examples for less overhead cost. But what you're doing here is you're sacrificing the variety of data that you got in that first sample. You're no longer looking at as many regions of the space. So we'd really like to try out both of these strategies, right, and figure out which one was more effective. But remember, we're researchers. We have limited amount of money. We have to choose one, and we have to implement it, and we have to move forward. So what our work does is we shift this regime where we're not limited by resources like this because we have all the ground truth data we want. And so what we're going to do here is having this ground truth, let's imagine we had sampled from different sampling strategies. And um, after simulating that, we'll observe the predictive performance of our model, and we'll be able to have a baseline comparison there. So our case study is in the Arizona housing market. So we have the sales of Ari the sale prices of homes from 2010 up in Arizona. And we're going to use this as just ground truth data for our observations. So the specific task we're looking at is given one of these images, uh, images like these on the right, can we classify them into like an average range of home prices or one of the two extremes? And so again, the point is not to make a really good predictor of home prices in Arizona. We already have this data. What we're doing is given a task that should be fairly simple, like I bet you could all classify these images correctly. Something that should be able to be pretty simple for a machine learning algorithm. Uh, how does it actually do under different data regimes? So we're going to look at five uh, simulated sampling strategies where the way to read these graphs is for the shaded region, every house within that region has an equal probability of being sampled. So our uniform baseline on the left is just every house has equal probability. Uh, we're going to compare that to clustering sampling strategies, which is close to what um, a lot of these existing data sources have. Uh, most of those are done in clusters. And that's, again, for these physical sampling constraint reasons. We're also going to look at east-west and north-south divisions. And you can think of this as the result of like, geographic or territorial boundaries. So if you have a census in one region and it just stops, how does that work when you're predicting neighboring regions? Uh, and so what we're measuring here is performance against a holdout set as a function of training set size. So, each sample here is an image and the associated average price of homes in that image. And we see exactly what we expect. Performance increases as a function of training set size. So the more samples we give it, the better we're doing. And this is for our uniform sampling strategy, which is going to be like our gold standard. It's something we would love to implement, but realistically, our constraints probably won't allow for it. So maybe we'll do something more like this clustering sampling strategy that's focusing on regions of high density. But we see performance is a lot worse. Um, to get the same performance that we got with 5,000 training sets, uh, training examples from the uniform set, we need like 60 to 80,000 from uh, this cluster sampling technique. And of course, it may be cheaper to implement the green bar, but there's some trade-off at which like, these lines don't appear to intersect. And if you want good performance, it may be worth it to spend more money on fewer, more quality examples. Uh, so maybe you want something in between, right? So if we do this um, clustering strategy with smaller clusters, but more of them, we get performance much closer to uniform. And for a cost, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, and this is similar for the north, south, and east, west sampling strategies as well. Uh, so what we see here is that sampling strategy does substantially affect predict predictive performance of these algorithms. And we're also indicating trade-offs in implementing sampling strategies in terms of wanting to get just the sheer amount of data as much as you can and also getting quality examples that are indicative of the entire space that you're working in. Um, we're also very excited about our ongoing directions for when and how it's appropriate to transfer models that you learn in one region 
uh, to another region so you can predict there as well. And how to use uh, your prior knowledge of what the satellite images in a re region look like. You know that distribution ahead of time. So can you come up with smarter algorithms for sampling if you're allowed to implement your own uh, data collection there? Like, how can you get uh, the best sample possible? Um, and all of this is ongoing work that we're using in implementation uh, that we're developing to scale to even larger data sets, hopefully on the size of the US, with the idea that this is something that everyone doing remote sensing analysis can use. Uh, because if we want to use these in remote regions, we especially want to know that they work in regions where we know the ground truth. OK. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next speaker is Stefan Steven Utzo, who's the chief scientist of the New York Hall of Science. That's the New York Science Museum that you see out in Queens. Uh, and he's going to talk about big data and the 95% solution. Stephen, do you have the clicker? Fantastic. Thank you. Um, this is about um, uh, uh, some work that we're doing around uh, using, exam using examples of uh, museum exhibits, digital museum exhibits, and how we think about big data. So um, understanding the dimensions of the quality of learning through data has been a holy grail for education for over a century. But using edu educational statistics has not been very effective. And we need to think well beyond uh, those kinds of statistics in order to better understand learning. So as Falk and Dierking argue, roughly 95% of learning happens outside the classroom. This indicates a need to go well outside the classroom to find out what learning is about and really advance our understanding of it. So what we argue in this paper is that the, there are new techniques that come out of informal learning experiences that allow us to explore learning in rich new ways and post um, but they also pose significant challenges that we have to address. So I'll go over a, a bunch of them in order to advance the field. Um, so if we think about this approach uh, uh, differently than what we consider, uh, I guess, classroom learning, it's really about allowing a shift from uh, out outcome-centric um, learning, so less about measuring the residue of learning activity and more in process-centric learning, which is about measuring the, the um, uh, what learners can do while they're learning and what they can what they can demonstrate and a shift from individual level learning to group level and context sensitive learning so rather the who changing from being highly focused on the on uh, knowledge and the success of individual learners onto uh, group learning and more distributed models of learning so um, one digital exhibit that we've developed at the hall of science is called connected worlds um, I'll give you a couple of ex examples, this one and another one. Um, this was, was a uh, large-scale exhibition opened in 2015, um, consisting of a series of virtual biomes, uh, including representations of grassland, desert, rainforest, and wetland, giving in, uh, visitors insights into how ecosystems respond to their decisions about how to intervene in the flow of water and the growth of vegetation. Um, they can use gestures to remove or, or plant vegetation, and they can use uh, uh, manipulatives to actually uh, move the water around. So data are streamed from this experience and logged in both graphical and tabular forms. Um, the, this list is about uh, is the, at a particular instance in the desert. Um, and then these uh, uh, tabular form, this is just a regular, how you would take that and put it into to a spreadsheet, all of these different parameters. And this is how it appears graphically. But we stream these data out. We store them and log them into a computer and then uh, bring them up to the cloud so that we can be downloaded from anywhere to, to analyze them. And um, the idea is to look for cues that indicate pro-social, anti-social, competitive behavior in groups of learners, and looking for a learning that happens in, in, uh, in more than one individual. And then this is another experience. It's a multi-touch table called OzTalk that was developed in collaboration with the University of Wisconsin. And participants learned about electronic circuits by sliding these coded blocks together. And we use an analytical system called Adage, uh, which is a click, I use a clickstream model for streaming events. Um, it's really good at recording data streams um, live in real time. So Mike Tissenbaum from the UW-Madison team developed this companion app, which actually um, provides critical information about user interactions. So you can alert a facilitator to, uh, to what's going on 
in case uh, participants are struggling with something and they can actually help and figure out how to make interventions on the fly. Um, but we also realize that there are a lot of others working in the field, not only in informal practice, but also in the much broader areas of learning research, tracking technologies and data analytics, and that bringing these folks together would be beneficial to the field. So we, we sponsored a workshop. This was actually, I think it's um, a year and a half ago, that um, we brought a, a group of about 50 people together, and, um, and I'm gonna talk a little about the outcomes of that workshop, which was really about how do we circumscribe um, learning in, in all of these different areas and, and apply it to, to some of these digital exhibits that um, are potentially useful for, for deeper learning. So one of the challenges is the state of the technology themselves. So in formal learning activities, I include many kinds of, of interactions with objects and other people, and many objects are not codable, they're not trackable. How do you, how do you deal with that? Um, another uh, is obviously that you have people interacting with each other, they're having lar you know, large-scale conversations, they're continuously moving around the space and doing things, and being able to track exactly what they're doing and with whom is not trivial. Um, and then also the sensors themselves. So if you are tracking people and you're using things like RFID or Bluetooth or, or uh, uh, phones, they have to hold something which brings in an experimenter effect, which is problematic. Um, and you know, the, gold, the, the, the gold standard is they have nothing to encumber them, nothing to feel that they're being tracked, um, even though they were required to tell them they are. But, um, but that, that doesn't interfere with their experience. And then obviously, how do we collect data? without uh, violating their, um, their privacy, and thinking about things like pre-processing strategies. So can you do something like if you want to know the emotional state or uh, excitement of a, of a person, you might be able to just record the tone of their voice and not their actual voice. Um, also, data require additional processing to be useful for analysis. We have the problem of cl data cleaning, which you know uh, is, is a is, a, is a, a tremendous amount of work, and the more data you have, the more cleaning you need to do in order to make sure that you have data sets that are, that are really useful. So things like having metadata standards and marker procedures so that you can actually um, um, annotate data with qualitative judgments. Um, you can note when audio is too noisy and it's basically you can't use it, things like that. And then also, are there human-in-the-loop automated data cleaning techniques that can be applied to flag problematic areas of data automatically so that you can actually pay attention to what's really important. Um, so there obviously there are um, analytical tools that are out there. There are ways of visualizing data, um, but you know, they're at a relatively rudimentary level. Um, we, we have very traditional techniques for doing this, uh, but allowing researchers to not only look at um, these uh, um, visualizations of data, but how do you visualize dynamic data? That's, a, that's actually a, a quite a bit of a problem. And then, you know, preserving contextual information or uh, within multimodal data streams so that you're, you're actually, you know, what, what's happening when you're looking at it that's, that may be outside of what you're looking at. Um, um, looking at um, creating a repository for best practices, expanding collection of uh, analysis phases to fill gaps in analytical knowledge, so the right data are collected and the right techniques applied at the right time because it's, you know, it's, again, the window of what you're looking at uh, tells you what you should be doing with it, but knowing what the context of all those things is, is, uh, is a problem. Extending analytical approaches to documenting learning um, and that uh, locating and extending methods may be more efficient than developing new techniques. So there are lots of techniques out there that we don't really use as effectively because the data are new and we think, well, we need to do something new with it when in fact, you know, there are things out there, um, particularly things that we use a lot, social network analysis, um, you know, a hidden Markov model, sequential pattern analysis. There are, there are ways to look at these data that we already have that we're maybe not using to look at these data. Um, and then incorporating non-researchers. So things like how do you build citizen science programs? How do you give uh, uh, visitors a, um, a sense of the value of this, of this kind of work? Um, and then there are ethical challenges. So, um, embracing diverse populations is obviously an issue. Um, learners have different learning needs and behaviors. If analytics are used to inform design or automatically personalized learning experiences, they're the, th the threat of misinterpreting or misunderstanding cultural, cognitive, effective, and demographic um, lead diverse um, learners and giving them the kinds of questions that don't, in don't, don't incorporate their own perspective on the world. Um, data ownership, um, obviously that's, uh, we, we know a lot about the issues related to that. 
there's some, um, you know, do, do, the own, do the learners own their own data? You know, it's, 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 it's the problem of, uh, so somebody's decoded my DNA, so do they own it because they created it, or do I own it because it's my data kind of thing? Um, and communicating research activities in the privacy issues of learner, um, how far can you go? How do you, um, how do you get them to understand the value of it and the ability to, to, to use it? Um, and also uh, give the, uh, the, uh, the layperson a, a, a real good understanding of what the risks are without exaggerating it or underestimating it. You know, how, do we get, how do we communicate that adequately to them? And then obviously the privacy and security risks that emerge when, um, when you take different kinds of data and conflate them. You know, we often gather biometric data, eye tracking, um, sometimes uh, heart rate sensors, using infrared to understand the flow of blood, that kind of thing. They, if individually, they don't tell you a lot except what's going on in, in a particular instance, but you combine that with much more personalized data, and all of a sudden you have something very intimate about somebody that, uh, that may not be, may be much more uh, a, a privacy risk. Um, okay, so also um, is the problem of, um, of, um, of the silos. So, you know, um, you know, how do you interchange ideas? Oh, I gave you a list of the four different Sort of, sort of disciplines that we were trying to bring together in this group, but sharing expertise across these silos is problematic, partly because the, everything from the uh, set of terminology that are used, um, shared understanding about the goals and methods, um, and communicating research to stakeholders. And finally, um, just thinking about um, forward, think of, thinking about how this kind of work can inform the design, um, how we support learners uh, through personalized and adaptive experiences, um, supporting new research questions, you know, how do we influence policy, create new standards for, um, for research. And I have to, of course, acknowledge the National Science Foundation for their work and thanks to, the Gide to Gideon and the Data for Good Exchange for, for uh, uh, hosting this, this experience. And please help us and communicate with us about this, this work. Thank you very much, Steve. As we said, we're tight for time, and we want to be able to hear all of this research. Our next speaker is Tanya Berger-Wolf. She is a professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago, a professor of computer science, and also the founder of Wildbook. She'll talk about Wildbook crowdsourcing computer, sci computer science, data science for conversation. Tanya. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'll try to stay within my 10 minutes. <laughs> um, how many elephants are there, and at what rate are they being poached and disappearing from the continent of Africa? Um, how far do whales travel? How many bobcats are left in this country? And uh, of the many thousands and hundreds of thousands of turtle hatchlings, how many of them survive to adulthood? So these are fundamental questions that every researcher in wildlife and conservation manager needs to be able to answer. Yet, shockingly, we do not know any reliable answers to these types of questions today. Of this 80,000 species that IUCN, International Unit on Conservation of Nature, the official body that grants the status of endangered uh, or other conservation status for species in the world, only of the 80,000, only 3.8 thousand have any kind of population numbers. We cannot do conservation. We cannot do wildlife management without it. Um, it is so important for elephants, for example. There was a two-year, $2 million effort to try to figure out the population of elephants, savanna elephants across the continent. And that was done with fly-by scanning. It's highly inaccurate. It doesn't track individuals. It gives you overall numbers. It's not scalable and not repeatable. Moreover, we can track animals with uh, GPS collars and uh, with GPS collars and radio collars, um, but it is highly expensive to put one on an animal. It takes about three thousand dollars per collar to put one on because you have to tranquilize an animal. Moreover, it can be detrimental and deadly quite often to the animals themselves. So what do we do? Scientists cannot track all the animals at all times everywhere in the world. Um, but today, images are the most abundant, readily available source of information about animals. 
and everything else, actually, for that matter. And these images are coming from all kinds of data, all kinds of sources, whether it's social media, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, or camera traps and field assistants and drones and, and, and scientists themselves and tourists visiting uh, the, the nature conservancies and going on whale watching. But how do you take these hundreds of thousands of images and pull out the information? Can you find all the elephants in those? <laughs> well, we can. We've created a, a algorithms that can take all these hundreds of thousands of images and pull out all the pictures of a given species, here are the elephants and the whales and the turtles and giraffes and zebras, and localize where the animals are in these pictures using deep learning. Uh, I can talk technical after a while, after this talk, if you're interested. But not only that, we're able to tell that not only this is zebra, whale, turtle, and elephant, but this is Zippy the zebra and Terry the turtle and Willie the whale. We can, we've developed algorithms for recognizing each individual animals because they're like walking fingerprints. And so now, with this information on individual animal, and we can do it for any striped, spotted, wrinkled, or notched, or uh, uniquely identifiable shape of the fluke, and now we're trying to do it for elephant ears, all these species. So with information now on when and where the image was taken, we actually can track individuals through images. We, here is Pinchy. She is the most sighted uh, sperm whale in the world. And she is uh, the, the, the celebrity in our wild book for, uh, for, for a cetaceous species. So the system that we build is called wild book. It's like wild book, um, another type of book for wild species. So <laughs> social, social kind of wild book. And, and this, this one is for cetaceous. It's called fluke book. So Pinchy is the most cited individual there. We, can, we get her picture. We get information about her. We, we get her social network of who she was cited with. Uh, we get other biological data if it was taken. We also get the map of uh, where she is. And if you're interested, the researchers who are studying uh, these particular sperm whales in the Dominica project, they're tweeting right now of what happens to whales during a hurricane from this data. So, because um, Dominica was devastated during the holiday. We can do population counts. We can do birth-death dynamic now, species range, and social interactions, and species interactions through photographs. Um, here is another wild book. This is for whale sharks. This is the oldest one. Uh, not only you can now adopt a whale shark, uh, you can uh, uh, also all the scientists and contributors, whether it's citizen scientists and tourists, divers, or actual researchers who are studying the species now figure out that they've all seen the same animal and you can start interacting. You can ask questions of scientists, but you can also, scientists can ask back the questions of what ha was happening when the pictures were taken. When, um, so you can uh, adopt and follow. Not only now we uh, use images from scientists and citizen scientists, but we scrape YouTube daily and pull out the frames that contain the species, the, the, the identify the frames automatically and use natural language processing to figure out the location of the video uh, if there is no geotagging data. And when we can't, we cannot do that with our bot posts on YouTube comments and saying, hey, you've just, uh, we've just identified your individual. It's in whaleshark.org. Um, but we can figure out where the video is taken. Could you mind telling us? And people do. And they engage with our bots and start following. Um, you can achieve active collaboration. Fifteen years ago, this site started as a local enthusiast uh, with, about two, with, a, with a few hundred individual whale sharks uh, without computer vision. Now it's scaled up with computer vision added and YouTube scraping. Uh, this is last week. Uh, I pulled out the numbers 88,566. And one of the top contributors, you'll notice, is the Wild Book AI. That's our YouTube scraper, top contributor to the website. Moreover, with numbers like these, uh, in that IUCN, that International Unit for Conservation, now uses this number as the official number uh, for the species estimate. Um, so it's becoming the basis for every research paper and wildlife management decision with evidence for whale sharks worldwide. 
Uh, we've deployed our first deployment was for gravy zebras in Leiva Conservancy in uh, uh, Kenya and uh, the headquarters of Gravy Zebra Conservation Trust. After using our system, uh, very quickly they realized that there are not enough adult, uh, juvenile zebras surviving to adulthood. And the main culprit uh, are, of course, lions. <laughs> <laughs> They've done such a great job on lion conservation that there were too many lions. And so with the data and evid evidence that they had from Wild Book, they, now, they were able to start a population management uh, system um, uh, program with contraception for lions to keep the, the balance between the predators and prey. Um, last year, we conducted the first ever full census of an entire species. This is the same gravy zebra, 98% of whom are in Kenya, using just people driving around for two days, taking pictures uh, of zebras all over Kenya. This was hundreds of people and uh, 40,000 uh, pictures of zebras later, we had the most comprehensive uh, census of the species ever in history. And, today, and we're doing it again this January. This is from local tribal chiefs and school kids to US ambassador to Kenya. Um, we've done a lot of data analysis to show that it is reliable. This is now, the, again, the official number for IUCN Red List. But if we're going to go to social media for data on animals, how reliable is, are those data? Can we take Flickr data and estimate population sizes? Uh, with all the biases that are coming in into the process of taking a picture, deciding to post it on social media, sharing it publicly, and so on, how reliable are those numbers? And uh, Shridith Menon, somewhere here, who is now in Bloomberg, uh, that was his master's thesis, giving, uh, de developing the whole study with Amazon Mechanical Turk and figuring out that it is a learnable problem of what people are going to share on social media and showing that the population estimate numbers from Flickr for Gravy Zebra, where we do have a ground truth, are within 1% accuracy for the, because it was done in 2016, the estimate, so we ha that's the number we have to compare. So this is amazing. Is it repeatable? We're now doing it for zebras and giraffes. Uh, sorry, for, for other species of zebras, giraffes and turtles. And in the meantime, we've built these uh, wild books for over a dozen species. The latest one is Giraffe Spot, a wild book for giraffes. And in collaboration with WWF International, we have uh, Internet of Turtle, the real IoT. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but our biggest concern now, one of the big concerns now is also security and privacy of data because you can not only, we can track the animals, poachers can. And so uh, with this, machine learning and data science allow us to really scale from pixels down to large scales and high resolutions over space, time, and individuals, and many, many people who engage with this. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you hand her a mic? So our next speaker is Wenfei Xu. Wenfei is a data scientist at Cardo.com, and she's going to talk about urban exploration, public park usage measured through mobile GPS. Wenfei. Hello. This is Hi. So my presentation today is called uh, The Social Life of Large Urban Parks, and for all those urban planners out there, you probably know the reference. Um, but I'm going to talk today about how we're using mobile phone data to understand public space usage. So starting from Holly White in the 1960s, who pioneered uh, fine-grained measurements of public space and how people use it uh, using uh, video recordings at the time, different stakeholders from planners to designers to policymakers have been very keenly interested in how uh, in measuring spatial temporal patterns in public space. Um, so, because it's an outdoor uh, public arena, data doesn't always naturally exist in these areas. And I know that like lately, um, people in the, uh, the public and private sectors have been looking into computer vision or sensor hardware to gather data. And um, I've done some of these types of projects myself, but um, here we're using a relatively traditional data set, um, mobile phone data, um, to hopefully uncover some kind of new and interesting uh, revelations about um, uh, granular metrics of public space usage and measurements of how space can influence um, social interaction. So 
The underlying question of this paper was, um, how can we create a better understanding of where people gather and which spaces are conducive to social interaction using mobile phone data? Um, and I'll quickly go through the method and we can take a look at the preliminary results that we have here. Um, so our, our, our raw mobile phone data has lat longs, uh, user IDs, and timestamps, and as well as some other features. Um, we use a one-dimensional range search to detect individual trips. And then the second step of this analysis was uh, we clustered our mobile phone traces used to find hotspots in the park using uh, the HDB scan algorithm. And if you're familiar with the DB scan algorithm, the H stands for um, a hierarchical tree, an optimization process for the algorithm. So, uh, so practically, this means that we can uh, model clusters of varying density. And these clusters don't necessarily have to follow a specific shape like a k-means or a regular DB scan. Um, and so uh, you can see that here um, in the park, we picked up clusters that are super dense um, near the low boathouse, but then kind of uh, less dense around the, the ramble and the, the, the bird feeder area. Um, so for this paper, we're looking at, um, at shared experience and how this is related to the size and the nature of the cluster. And here I'm comparing the number of unique trips per cluster to the average percentage of shared time that people on that cluster experience together. And I don't think it's surprising that you find a roughly linear relationship here. And this is on a log-log scale, by the way. But what I'm more interested in, in are these kind of areas where you have a higher than expected, um, or these clusters where you have a higher than expected percentage shared experience? Or uh, these areas that kind of have a lower than expected percentage shared experience? So uh, I've picked up um, five or six of the most kind of egregious outliers to take a look, uh, to, to take a closer look to see if I can um, get a better understanding of what explains these kinds of activity. Um, and it seems like this kind of higher percentage share time expected, these clusters are all around um, kind of known points of interest. Um, so here we have like a, you know, this Oak Bridge or the Alice in Wonderland, I think it's a statue, um, and a baseball field. And all of these are kind of expected results. Um, when I take a look at the kind of lower percentage share time um, than expected, I see kind of also some expected results. Um, intersections and roads are have a lower percentage share time, but I'm also getting some pools and, again, baseball fields. So this is still kind of like the, prelimin the preliminary results. Um, so I think what ultimately these initial results are showing, and I think they're quite promising, is that um, they're answering our question in that we initially set out. Um, and I think they could have like a, a policy or practical decision-making implications as well. Um, they seem to suggest that um, if you want to create spaces that attract an unusually high amount of potential social interaction, um, one way to do this is to make a place that's a known destination. Um, and this is lastly, just uh, quickly, uh, a preview of the broader project that we're working on here. Um, we're doing a meta comparison of all the park usage in New York to see whether um, small pa parks have more uh, bang for their buck compared to, um, to large parks. Um, and if you look at it on a kind of visitor count per square foot. And our initial findings showed that our, I her, bleh, I her, our hypothesis seems to be true. Um, if you look at the slope of this chart, it's um, 0 0.8, so indeed visitor counts scale sublinearly to park area. In other words, um, increasing the size of the park doesn't necessarily give you a similar boost in terms of increasing the number of visitors to that park. Thank you very much. These are the last two. This is our last speaker, and we're delighted to have Professor Bill Howe. He's an associate professor in the Information School at the University of Washington, and he'll talk about synthetic data for social good. All right, thanks. So uh, I was told that I wasn't allowed to use the word fake data because it's taken on a different context in today's <laughs> political discourse. But I'm, I think I'm here to take back the word fake, and we can, we can use it freely. So, okay, so I think four, four out of five of our authors, I think, are uh, here at the conference. So come and interact with any of us and hear more about what we're trying to do with this stuff. But uh, in the next couple of minutes, I just want to talk about an example that motivated us. But, but part of my point is that this seems to apply. Uh, everybody is coming out of the woodwork to come and talk to us about uh, this, this capability that we're just getting started 
uh, doing. And then I'll spend a little bit of time on, on a couple of the technical details. Okay, so one of the motivating examples for us was in the Seattle area, the observation, which I think is probably true everywhere, that different pathways through different services for homeless families tend to, lead, uh, uh, the eth which of these pathways are more efficacious than others is largely not well understood, in part because you have to integrate data from a bunch of different agencies and a bunch of different places and so on. Uh, and the overall goal here is to recommend sort of very specific services for particular families. And so, you know, emergency shelters through transitional housing to rapid rehousing and so on may be a different outcome than something else for different people with different uh, uh, backgrounds. Uh, and so the problem we have here is that if we want to study this problem, you end up having to get at least four data sharing agreements, and sometimes it may be 10 or 20 or something, and each one of these may take 18 months or, 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 or more to get. But, and that's fine, we can go through that work and so on. But the bigger problem is that there's a whole set of other people we'd like to be able to bring into the party to collaborate with us, but they don't necessarily have an appetite for signing their own data sharing agreements or to be brought into these rules. So there's some smart machine learning colleague we might like to interact with, and of course they have students, and you know, maybe there's software vendors that want to take a, take a shot at this. Uh, there's curious undergrads that may, not, may or may not be sort of, you know, contributing all that much, but we'd certainly like to have them work on a class project. Uh, reproducibility zealots may be sort of angry about when we publish things and can't share the data. Uh, so for all these cases, and, and many, many more, you know, other agencies might want to share data amongst themselves and so on, we wanted to hand them something, but we can't give them the real data because of privacy concerns. Uh, giving a, you know, a straw man solution might be to just generate some kind of completely fake data set from nothing, but what we find is it doesn't really do any good. If real data is quite dirty and has all sorts of interesting, funny characteristics, you know, what does NA mean here in GPA? Uh, there's both missing values in this geography column for this is uh, education data. Uh, there's a missing column, but there's also an unknown value. So what's the difference between those two? And if you don't sort of capture some of those idiosyncrasies, whatever people are doing with their fake data won't really be meaningful uh, when you go try to apply it back to the real data. And then there's also you know, ambiguous attributes that are hard to in interpret. So you can start having these conversations over the fake data uh, before you go back and try the real data. Fine, so we want fake, so that leads us to kind of two desiderata. One is it should really be structurally and statistically similar to the real data. However, if you start trying to derive data from real data, you run the risk of actually having privacy violations, even in cases where you don't think it would be the case, right? So you think if you're making, uh, uh, if you think if you're sort of building a statistical model and then sampling it, that you'd probably be pretty safe, but it turns out you, there are sophisticated and unsophisticated attacks you can do against that to, to violate privacy. But coming to our rescue is this notion of differential privacy, which in one slide, and I apologize for the math here, the idea is that you know, there's two possible worlds. The world where your data was included, your, your information was included in the data set, and the world where your information was not included in the data set. And differential privacy says that you should not be able to distinguish between these two worlds up to some epsilon. Right? So it's a pretty, it's a pretty conservative guarantee. And so this, this sort of wonkiness here is that a query over the data set that doesn't include your data gives you some result. Well, that same query over the data set that does include your data uh, give you the same result. That those, the differences in those two probabilities should be about the same. And so the general approach here for differential privacy writ large is to add noise to the query result to sort of hide the contribution, right? So you get a, an average or a total and you noise it up a little bit uh, to hide the most extreme individuals that led to that aggregation. In our world, it's about deriving a statistical model from the real data adding noise to that in sort of careful ways and then sampling that noisy distribution to get a fake data set. Is that sort of clear? Okay. So fine, so the workflow here, we're also big on tools. We didn't really necessarily invent some of these um, methods of driving synthetic data. There's a lot of literature out there, but we are sort of interested in making practical tools for agencies to use. And so you can sort of throw in a CSV file, get some initial statistics and kind of review them to make sure they make sense. Uh, noise it up in particular ways with a few parameters if you choose to use them, generate a fake data set, and then sort of crucially be able to compare the fake data set with the real one to sort of sanity check what you're, what you're looking at. If it should look especially different or it should look uh, 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 the same, you can check that. Um, there are three modes here. Totally random data is not actually as useless as it may sound. There's even, the, even just the basic structure of the data sometimes use, useful. Independent attribute mode is, is every, every attribute is considered completely independent, which is sometimes useful, but sometimes not. And then there's a thing where we can de derive a sort of Bayesian network to capture the correlations and then, and then noise that up and sample it appropriately. Okay, uh, and so the, you can check for the correlations in the, in the tools we're building as well. Um, and then we're interested in some extensions here about you know, fake linked data between different sources of data. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. So there's complications in various ways that we're interested in, in doing, including scaling this up to really, really large data sets. 
mixing real and fake data for particular applications, adversarially generating fake data sets to capture certain scenarios. And I'll stop there by throwing up the, uh, the URL here. So find out more at dataresponsibly.com. And if you are interested in us helping you generate a fake data set, let us know and we can do that for you. Thank you. That was really fast. Can I ask all the speakers to stand up? And can I ask everyone to give them a big round? That was hard to do.